everybody. Welcome back to the Receivables Fallen Empires Edition. I'm your host, Cedric Phillips at Cedric A. Phillips on all the things, and I am joined by Thalid's biggest fan, uh, Patrick Sullivan at Basic Mountain on Twitter. You have a booster box of this set. Yes. Oh, nice. It's right here. It's right here. Okay. What if the Fallen Empires were the LGSs we sold this set to along the way? <sighs> My gosh. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm just going <laughs> to rip the ba- the proverbial Band-Aid off here. P.U. This set stinks. Well, it's complicated. There's a lot of perspectives from which it stinks. We'll talk about it. Yes, we will. But the... Part of the set that probably stinks the most is I would bet this is the set that of any set came the closest to killing magic. Now, <laughs> that has something to do with the set and more to do with some of the sales and stuff going along. We'll talk about it. Yes, we will. But this uh, for. If you've been watching the show for a while, you know that magic is kind of going on this upward arc through the story. They're just, feeling themselves. We're just right. We're, we're printing cards. Yeah. And they sell it instantly, and yeah. then we print more cards. They sell it instantly. We print more cards. They sell it instantly, and it's like, what if we printed ten times as many cards, but none of them were good or appealing? And then we just sent that to everyone. What would happen then? All right, we got to dial it back. Yeah, okay. lesson learned. Yeah. So you know when you're when you're kind of going off, business is going well, and we've always go over the print runs or the estimated print runs of how much they've, you know, done for each set. And it's always like, that number's kind of low. That number's kind of low. And like, it would consistently kind of increase. Uh, As you're going to find out here, uh, they take a swing with the number on the estimated print run here. And uh, yikes. Yeah, this is some Dr. Evil. (laughs) One billion cards. (laughs) (laughs) Whoops. Yeah. Whoops, indeed. So, of course, we're going to do our thing. And doing our thing here with Fallen Empires, always starts with the facts of the set. Let's do it. All right, everybody, it is now time to go over the facts of Fallen Empires, which first and foremost, it is Magic's fifth expansion. It's not part of any block. It's the last set to use the tilted T tap symbol. And it is sold in eight card packs. I was going to say eight horrible card packs, but no, I would actually qualify it a different way. They tried to sell these <laughs> in eight card boosters, <laughs> but they ran into some difficulty along the way. Uh, six commons and two uncommons in those eight card packs. Uh, Fallen Empires was released in November 1994. The print run was an estimated. 350 what? To, to 375 million cards. So just in case you haven't kept up with the entire series here, that is more than 100 times the print run of Arabian Nights. More than 100 times the print run. Uh, I'm going to get the Arabian Nights. It's 3 million, right? I'm going to get the number here. Uh, the print run was announced by Wizards to be 5 million cards. Oh, I'm sorry. Close to 100 times. <laughs> Close. I thought Close. it was three. Yes. My apologies. That's it's okay. five. That's okay. But we're still talking about 60 something times as many cards. Yeah. Uh, they printed a lot of this thing. Uh, it was available from mid-November 1994 uh, to sometime in 1998. Now, a couple of fun notes. The frenetic pace of 1994 had blinded everyone to the reality of an upward limit to the number of cards a small set could sell because remember this is an expansion yeah and i'll get to the number of cards here in just a moment but it is a it is a rather small set as a result fallen empires was deemed overproduced <laughs> which is uh very accurate can you back up for a moment i'm can happy you, can to. you uh again say the duration of time this was on available like on shelves uh mid november 1994 to sometime in 1998 okay so Sometime in 1998 is vague. Let's call it January 1, just to be charitable. Okay. Again, in the previous installments of the series, when we're talking about those early expansions, the amount of time that these sets are on the shelf is a matter of weeks. Yeah, it's not long. One to two months, six weeks, that sort of cadence is common. This was on the shelf for three years. Yeah. Three years. Someone buy this, please. This was such a such a black eye on the game. 
I was there at the time. I sort of got in, you know, I guess December of 94, January of 95, I want to say, kind of in that range. Okay. So this was the first set that I was the new release. Okay, I, sure. I, I had access to Revise. That was at the store. The other expansions were pretty hard to find, but you just encountered cards at your LGS here and there. Okay. This was the first expansion that came out while I was an active player, and it was a punchline among the players and was really destabilizing for local stores because, it, again, Magic at this point was just, it was pretty money. Yeah. And this was the first time that there was a set that came out that was like, we cannot sell this. Yeah, sure. And so I imagine if you're a local store and Magic is essentially printing money, right? You're just like, oh, new sets coming out? Yeah, we'll take as much as you'll give us. Right. So let me reference the booster box here. I think it has the MSRP on it. Okay. Yeah. So it says dollar forty-five a pack right here. You could get this at the LGS for under a dollar. Oh. Wow. I mean, we're talking again, just to frame it, magic sets come out and the booster packs are immediately two, five, ten X retail, and then they're sold out. Yep. Okay. And this is fifty percent under MSRP. Okay. At the local shop. Not like going to a flea market or whatever, but just at the card store. Yeah. Because people were stuck with so much product. Although they stopped shipping in late January 1995, enough cards were printed to keep them on the shelves for years afterwards, which Patrick just explained. Uh, Even some 15 years after the initial release, booster boxes uh, could be found at roughly the same prices when they were first released. I don't know about now, but... Well, when I got this box, which is a little ding- dinged up or whatever, I got this, I want to say in the early 2010s, 2011, 2012, for, I believe, $90 in store credit Okay, at uh, Star City Games. And there are, I believe, 60 boosters in this box. So 60 times $1.50 a pack, that gets you to $90. Yeah, roughly. So that's <laughs> the same price minus inflation adjustment. <laughs> sure. And again... If you're familiar with like buying old magic product, old sealed boxes are like they go at quite the premium expensive. Yeah. Even the older sets that don't have a lot in terms of uh, individual cards that are desirable. The boxes are still pretty expensive because there's only so many of them. And a sealed box of an old set is a collector's item. Not these. No, not these. They are now. I I do know that these boxes go, I think, for a couple hundred dollars. I, I haven't looked recently. Okay, It has gone up in the way that all of old magic sealed product has gone up but definitely in a much softer trajectory than (laughs) these surrounding sets, let's say. You can still get it. You can still get it. Not that hard to find. Uh, The failure of Fallen Empires to sell on time, plus the additional expense of warehousing the unsold product, caused Wizards of the Coast considerable expense, particularly when it is considered that Revised, which was in short supply, had been scaled back to accommodate the orders for Fallen Empires. So... What does Wizards of the Coast do about this um, disaster? Well, after Fallen Empires, Wizards of the Coast would carefully decide how much of a particular product to print. So they're on this upward trajectory that they fired this gigantic rocket of 350 to 375 million cards. And they said, you know what? Maybe we should have some sort of a uh, formula, perhaps. So uh, they established one. The sales team did it, Watsy. And how much uh, for how much new product the distributors received was based on how they scored on a profile. Now, how much the local retailer got was in turn determined by the distributors, each of whom had different ways of deciding how much of their allocation would go to the retailers. Some of this allocation would go to mass market retailers, which didn't have games as their core business, like your targets and your Walmarts of the world. But for those of you who don't actually know how this works, basically Wizards makes a set. And then, you know, make however much they're going to make of this at whatever. And then they sell them to distributors. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, my time working at Ultimate Guard, I understood the distributor retailer relationships. So you sell them to distributors um, like Southern Hobby and I think GTS and a couple other like there's plenty across the world, of course. Yeah. But those are some American ones. OK, great. And then those distributors reach out to local stores or vice versa that are within their network. And they go, yo, we got March of the Machine or the new Lord of the Rings set. And they go, all right like how much you want. And then, you know, they have that conversation about how many cases or boxes, what are their allocation is going to be. And I'm sure there's probably like some levels to this of like, if you're a premium retailer or whatever the heck, right. You get more as opposed to, if you're like a new store, who's just getting started, you get access to less. Okay, great. Fine. Because the distributors have a finite amount of product. Okay, fine. So, um, and then as I mentioned, some of this goes over to your, um, 
your mass market retailers, like your targets and your Walmarts of the world. So as you were telling me before the show, this sort of allocation type thing, stores would basically go like when these sets were coming out, they're just like, I want a million cases. Right. My, I don't know if this is true, but this is what I've heard from some people who I have cause to believe. Okay. Let's say okay. that back in the day, again, magic, all the sets sell out instantly. You can't keep it on the shelves. So, you know, distributor comes to you and they're, they're asking you how many cases of the new set that you want. And you just write down the highest number. Sure. Like, I'll take, I'll take 10. I don't know. I don't, I don't care. Knowing that you would only get a fraction of that because magic was so popular and these uh, wholesalers, these distributors, they have a lot of mouths to feed. So they kind of allocate in the way that you're describing. Mm-hmm. There's certain levels. And if you buy X, you move up sort of in their rankings and priorities or whatever. And then you get some fraction of what you ordered. Yep. And this is just the way of doing business back in 94, 93. Fallen Empires, my understanding, was basically the first one that was uh, print to order. So there's this sort of uh, collision of the set would not have been very desirable anyway for reasons that we're going to get into meets people were trained to order knowing that they would only get 10 or 20% of what they ordered. And this time just 10 cases of this <laughs> showed up at their door one day. You got it. Congratulations. No problem. Yeah. You're on our super tier one list. <laughs> You'd have all the fallen empires you want. You have a line directly to me. I'm going to give you this phone number. This phone number goes directly to me. And you just tell me how much Fallen Empires you want. I'll send it. I'll send it air mail. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. Free yeah. air mail. Yeah. You could just take it. We'll eat the cost. Yeah. On the no problem. Fine. Because you're just our best store. Yeah. yeah. And then <laughs> click, hang, call up the next door, run the same game on them. Yeah. Just trying to move through it. You know, trying to get this. See, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get this off of our shelves and onto yours. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So our refund policy is that we don't do it. <laughs> yeah. So, but look, Hoverits magic. It's yes. so popular. You have so many Hoverits. It's so, do you know how many artworks are in full daily and soldier? Have you told, have you told your customers that there's four different pieces of art on full daily and soldier? Are. Why aren't you able to sell this? <laughs> uh, next notes. Fallen empires contains 102 cards. As I mentioned, small set, uh, 187 total unique cards. That's a weird thing to say. Uh, and it contains 120 unique commons if you count art and flavor text variations. So let's do our breakdown. For those of you who love the little print run analysis, there are 35 commons, 15 at C4 and 20 at C3. There are 31 uncommons, 25 at U3, 5 at U2, and 1 at C1. And there are 36 rares. That's 36 at U1. Each common card of C4 rarity has four pieces of art, like your good buddy, daily and soldier oh yeah there's four there's four of celebrating them. the lore of merfolk squire mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh each uh has a different flavor text which is true uh each common card of c3 rarity has three pieces of art each with a different flavor text so the availability of multiple versions of all empire commons was an experiment to see if players liked to see more art on commons Ultimately, it was decided that having too many artworks associated with one card made it more difficult for players to identify a card quickly. Now, that would be crazy if nowadays in Magic, if cards had just all these different artworks and borders and not borders and hubbubaloo and weird artworks from various people and layers that may or may not be secret. Just that would be strange. It's odd. I think this is confusing cause and effect. Okay. Because... Sure, there is some complexity that comes along with multiple pieces of art. Yes. But to me, what it seems to be, uh, what's going on there in that sort of analysis is this was a historically underachieving set. What are the ways that this set is different from the sets that came before it? Ah, yeah, the art. And then it happens to be an extra benefit that commissioning that much extra art costs money. Yep. So then you just have two arguments for getting rid of it. Players were confused by the multiple arts. I'm not sure. I wasn't confused about it, nor were the players in my play group. Do you know why? We didn't play with any of these cards. (laughs) To have it be confusing, the cards need to be in decks and in play. That's true. And that never happened. (laughs) Sure. Sure. So there was no confusion. I don't really buy this line. Okay. This feels like retrofitting some sort of. You know, the, oh, the the reason Mercadian Masks wasn't popular was because there was no keywords. It's like, really? 
You sure that's the reason why? Yeah, or maybe the cars all stunk. Or maybe the cars were boring. Yeah, not sure, fun. Sure, sure. Okay. Well, well anyway, d- back to it. Um, I do find it interesting, like, just the idea of people, like, opening up a booster and, and seeing, like, a new piece of artwork. And it's like, wait, but that's just the same card. It's just different. It's also, this is not the first time this happened. Yeah. Antiquities had multiple pieces of art for the same card. That's true. Not That's true. nearly as dense as, as this, this set. Yes. But it's not like this was even new. That's you true. Four different artworks for Mistress Factory. Yep. Four different artworks, sort of, for Strip Mine. Yeah. They all kind of look the same, but they're t- different artworks for the Urza Lands. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So it's not, this is not uncharted territory. And it wasn't like this was a source of confusion back with a- Antiquities. And those cards, Strip Mine and Mistress Factory, actually got played. That's true. So again, true. I don't, this feels like someone trying to, oh yeah, the problem with Fallen Empire, uh, you, these artists, you just can't trust them with anything. <laughs> sure, it, was, sure. it was so, all these different Ication Javelineers was so confusing. <laughs> sure. And that's why we couldn't sell the 500 million cards of this <laughs> that we would have otherwise breezed through. Uh, let's talk about the set symbol. <laughs> Fallen Empire set symbol is a crown uh, to symbolize the concept of an empire. And when I'll talk about the uh, team that designed and developed this set, it's the same four people in Scaff Elias, Jim Lynn, Dave Petty, and Chris Page names that if you've been keeping up with the series, you are extremely familiar with. Now, I will say one thing about the art in question of this set. I think the art's really good. Yes. I think the art on these cards, um, like, you know, obviously we have the art come up between us during the show. Like The art on these cards is good. Yeah. It's cool. I mean, D- Dwarven Ruins is my favorite piece of magic art full stop okay part of that is i played in a lot of decks when i was like a kid playing in my lgs some of it i i just i think the way that the name and the art and the mechanics merge is it's a wonderful piece of creative art the entire thing of that card okay and i also just think it's like it's just cool sure i remember looking at that thing being like this is cool i would say from a creative standpoint a critique that i have of this set is so you go Legends, the Dark, and then Fallen Empires, which is kind of the uncanny valley between Legends and the Dark, minus any of the things that are FUD. Sure. Okay. So you have the story. It's sort of like, yeah, it's medieval, and there's this conflict and war going on. Legends kind of has that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Where are the gold cards and the Legends? Those are gone. We don't, we don't need those. Those are too fun. Just out of here. Okay. And then there's also this sense of like ruin, decay, things getting worse. Uh, and the dark taps in that a lot, and it, and then it then it's like oh well, so where are the all the familiar horror tropes that I come to associate with this? The, too fun, those are gone too. Yeah, sure. So you basically sure. have a set that is derivative of the previous two and worse than both. Yep. And that combined with the cards themselves, how they play, is really rough. But some of the art's awesome. Yeah, it's like gorgeous. Yeah. Well, everyone. Those are the facts of Fallen Empire. As we're taking our short break and we come back, we are going to very quickly go over the flavor and the storyline of Fallen Empires. See you in a sec. All right, everybody. It is now time to quickly go over the flavor and storyline here of Fallen Empires. And I say quickly because I have two bullet points and that's it. Uh, After the Brothers' War on the Dominarian continent of Sarpedia, I hope I pronounced that correctly, the Ice Age is approaching, and as a result of the changing climate, it results in dwindling resources and fighting amongst allies for survival. Sarpedia is a remote continent in Dominaria's southern hemisphere that was ravaged by warfare during the period between the Brothers' War and the Ice Age. That is literally all I have for you. I could not really find anything else, so... People are kind of battling it out. Right. It's like there's a war. You go to the grocery store. There's no toilet paper. <laughs> there's one roll left. You and some other person fight over it. Okay. But and then but that at a larger scale in medieval. Sure. It's like resources are sparse. And so there's fighting. Yeah. And so then not exactly. Not like deep. Yeah, we know that <laughs> that's the foundation for nearly every <laughs> conflict. <laughs> That sure. involves like a, a a big world. It's not that you need to give me a little more than that. Yeah. This is uh before the days of what you see now in 2023 magic of real world building and legendary creatures and all this stuff. Because you know what happens in a world of abundance? 
people still fight over stuff. It's true. So that's not enough of a creative, like the world always has conflict. Give me a little more to work with here. Yeah. I, I, sorry. I'm, I can't, I'm sorry. Yeah. I tried. No, it's okay. I tried. This is the best I could do. No, I know you're just working with what you were dealt with. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, sort of saying for, uh, as rich as magic world building is at this point. Yeah. Uh, this is sort of lacking. Yeah. It's not great. And so that's why we're going to move on to, well, there's also the issue of like, so you do all these creature types, right? I'm sorry to keep going. That, this. Uh, yeah. It's I'm like, surprised you're still going. So, so there's go ahead. all this, like there's this fighting. And so you have, you know, like the order of the ebon hand and order leaper and sort of the adjacent stuff. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. I could see it's white knight versus black knight. And you know, there's this like, uh, underground pit some demons versus sort of a conventional medieval town with citizens and a bureaucracy and all that okay, okay cool i'm with you so far that's great what does green do okay well there's these little fungus people <laughs> and they make more of themselves it's like well i really don't know how they're fitting into the other two things and also it really doesn't seem like they're they're scarce on resources because they just self-replicate sure so sure. what what is going on here? What do they need? Yeah, order the ebon hand and order leaper. Okay, that sounds like a conflict that would be fought primarily on the ground. Yep, they're fighting over food and whatever. What are the homrades up to? Well, they really care about high tide and low tides. <laughs> it's <laughs> like okay, so are they anywhere near these other people? Do they care about <laughs> anything at all? You know what I mean? It sure. seems like they could just swim into the ocean and grab like little prawns or whatever they eat. Well, yeah, know. whatever it is they eat. I assume they don't eat people, but I'm not sure. Right. So there's this weird architecture of like the creature types that are highlighted here don't really even align with the story that's going on yeah no not really at all. i'm done with this for now please Thank continue goodness uh that's your flavor and storyline aspect of fallen empires short break coming back longer portion of the show mechanics right after this All right, we are now back for the mechanics of Fallen Empires, of which there are um, some, which is a welcome change from the last couple of episodes. So let's start off with the fact that Fallen Empires is seen as a flavorful set, as the flavor text on the cards could be used to piece together a story. And another theme is the creature types or tribal theme of Fallen Empires. For the first time, universal creature types were used, tying the creatures in this expansion together, and multiple cards reference these creature types. So, uh, in white, you've got Order of, you say Lieber? That's how we pronounce it as, I don't know okay. for sure. Maybe Silent maybe not. For this episode, we're going with Order of Lieber. These are the folks from Acacia and the Feralites. For blue, there's the Merfolk, which are part of the Vodalians, and then uh, the Homerids. For black, there's the order of the order of the Ebon Hand, and then the Thralls. For red, there's dwarves, goblins, and orcs, and then for green, there's elves, and uh, as you mentioned previously, the Thalids. Fallen Empires has an extreme use of tokens and counters. The resulted this resulted in confusion because of the many different kinds of tokens and counters that were used. Now, if you're with us for our episode of the Dark, you may remember Frankenstein's monster and some of the nonsense going on there, and they decided. Let's crank it up a little bit. The problem with Frankenstein's monster is that it's really confusing if there's only one in the set. It gets easier to process if you have 25 of them. Okay, we'll see about that. Uh, there <laughs> That's was, not actually true. Yeah, there, there were so many <laughs> cards that produced tokens and or required counters that Wizards of the Coast issued a cardboard sheet of them in Duelist number four. <laughs> okay, so. That's I, just a magazine. I have a little story here about this. Okay. Uh, so. Eugene Harvey, you know, high school friend of mine, your boy, one of the greatest magic pros of all time. Uh, we would go to his house a lot to play magic over the summer on weekends. OK, he had the most accommodating parents okay. of, of anyone in our group. So it was very common for us to all go over there. And the basement at Eugene's house was pretty much open season. You know, like we didn't go upstairs. The main area there, wherever was kind of like for people to actually live and eat and stuff. Okay. Basement, anything goes. Just okay. Whatever. Okay. So Eugene and his brother opened a lot of product and that product would just end up on in the basement. You know, like they pick, they take the rare out of the pack and the rest of it's just in a pile. Or sure. Whatever. So once we heard about booster drafting, Eugene was really into the idea of doing that. And he made booster packs of just 15 random cards off of his basement floor. Okay. And we used to draft just random cards okay this way okay uh as you can imagine fallen empires 
very heavily represented in this draft format <laughs> because there's it wasn't it wasn't expensive to get those packs and so we just had a lot how of much them. was it a dollar like a dollar. dollar in 1996 it was a dollar okay which is like 50 cents in today's money yeah, okay sure this is like nothing okay um or sorry yeah uh, two dollars. So I had it the wrong way. Yeah, that's Whatever. fine. Still much it's cheaper still than nothing. Ma- still much cheaper than the Magic Booster. Um, so I played draft with Fallen Empires in our own way. Okay, and the counter stuff was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's if you play with a lot of Fallen Empires cards, this comes up. Okay. Of okay. just like I have a like if you have a Thalid and a Homerid. What is going on? <laughs> sure. You have sure. to get, I mean, the, the, the wizards putting out the duelist thing is helpful, but you have to basically get, you know, if you're in the United States, your mileage may vary depending on what country you're in, but you have to get pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, uh, sure. and basically be like, these are my thousands. These are my homrads. These are my Aikisha and Jeff near slash money changer tokens. Okay. Like you have okay. to assign it somehow because it's so saturated with token generation. Okay. Uh, well, he's not wrong about that. Trust me. As I'm going to tell you in just a moment. Uh, as a result, fall, uh, I mentioned the Duel Number Four thing here. So, as a result of Fallen Empires and some other cards like Frankenstein's Monsters, I mentioned just a moment ago, only plus one, plus one, and minus one, minus one counters were used to modify creatures, with a few exceptions. Kind of moving forward after this set, this changed with the introduction of ability counters in Ikoria and Commander 2020. I'm thinking mostly of like Crystalline Giant, where like on your upkeep, I think like something just it would get like a random counter. It would maybe get flying, and maybe get like. I, I, maybe hex proof was one of them, whatever. Maybe it's on the screen right now. I don't know. But yeah, that's when things change. Now, Fallen Empires features 14 different types of counters. You want to play a game? Yeah, I'll see how I can do. Okay. I'm going to name the counter type. Patrick's going to try to name the card or cards. Javelin counter. Vacation Javelin here. That is correct. Credit counter. Vacation Money Changer. That is correct. Tide counter. Um, like just the Homerid stuff. You're in the ballpark. Homerid Grey Ogre. Yeah, Homerid is correct. Okay, Homerid, okay. just Homerid. There's also another card. Is it the spawning bed? It is Tidal Influence. I have no idea what that card is. <laughs> okay. Uh, net counters. Uh, Mercy. Correct. Has that, has that been updated to stun counters? I think it's functionally just stun, right? You know, I have this wonderful website called Scryfall open. And more, I'm have tell they you, ruined more of my childhood with functional errata? There are four Mercene arts. Yeah. I can't wait. Sure. To, I can't wait to see which one John or editor picks. Yeah. Got a lot. This probably is horrible. Well, to probably edit. the one with the, I, John, put up the one with the butt cheek. <laughs> the dude in the net. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, <laughs> it's 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 net counters still okay it's Not, still net counters. yeah it's still right, net great. counters okay um time counters time counters uh no idea torox gate never really gotten that okay good to know uh spore counters uh fungal bloom that's one valid that's two uh uh elvish farmer Three. Is there more? Oh, yeah. I'm tapping out. I can't believe I got three. I'm surprised you got three, too. Uh, there's Elvish Farmer, yes. Feral Thalid, Fungal Bloom, <laughs> Spore Flower, Thalid, Thalid Devourer, and Thorn Thalid. Seven. That gets spore counters. What was it? Sorry. Can you read that list again? Oh, I, happily. Elvish Farmer, Feral Thalid, Fungal Bloom, Spore Flower, Thalid, Thalid Devourer and Thorn Thalid. Feral Thalid is an incredible name. It's like, what is this fungus's deal? Well, it's feral. It's just ready. <laughs> it's ready to rock and roll. You said, you said Feral Thalid. I'm like, I sort of remember that, but I also sort of believe that can't possibly be the name. It's got great artwork, too. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's really a, yeah. that's a humdinger. Uh, how about uh, cube counters? Uh, the, the Silex or the cube? Draw News Cube is Dilith's Cube. Dilith's Cube. There you go. There you go. Uh, that'll be winning an award later. Storage counters. Uh, the uh, the cycle of lands. You, um, you got to name at least one. Uh, is it's Evan Stronghold is the Tomes and Play Tap one, I think. Yeah, that's not one of them. Uh, Dwarven Hold? Correct. Okay. Well done. Uh, the five lands are Acacian Store, Hollow Trees, 
sand silos, dwarven hold, and bottomless vault. Ah, bottomless mm-hmm. vault. That's right. Uh, plus O plus one counter. Oh God. Oh, homerids. Wrong. Plus O plus one. Correct. I have no idea. Dwarven armorer. Oh God. Yep. <laughs> let me let me get this banger up here. Okay. Uh, next plus one plus O counter. Uh, Evan Predator and Dwarven, the same guy. Correct. Okay. Dwarven armor. Dwarven armor. Okay. Well done. Well done. Minus two, minus two counter. Also, Evan Predator. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, plus two, plus two counter. Oh, there's <laughs> no way. This is so brutal. Uh, Plus two, plus two. Mm-hmm. That seems like a lot of stats to get out in this set. I don't know. I'm gonna call. I'm I'm calling trick question. There's no way. Soul exchange. I don't know what that card. Black is. black sorcery. Sack a creature, but remove it from the game instead of putting it in your graveyard. Okay. Take a creature from your graveyard and put it directly into play as though it were just summoned. Put a plus two plus two counter on this creature if the creature sacrificed was a thrall. Okay. Okay. There you go. That card's actually kind of nice. It's, not it's bad. like stuff you could do with that. It's not bad. Uh, plus one, plus two counter. <laughs> what? What? This is really, this is really easy. This is, I have I have no idea. This is, it, there's four there's four artworks for this one card. Oh, oh, it's one of the four artists. Uh, is it armor thrall? It is armor thrall. Oh uh, yeah, it is armor thrall. Well done. Thank you. Uh, and then we have minus one, minus one counter. Stop. Sorry. This is the last one. I don't know. Uh, there are two of them. There is Torox chant and Th- I think it's pronounced Thielen's chant. Okay. There you go. Wow. Uh, Fallen Empires, more notes, by the way, slash mechanics. Fallen Empires is the first expansion to use a con- consolidated set of universal creature types. Uh, this also plays into the creature type or tribal theme of the expansion, as I mentioned earlier. Of the 14 creature types used in Fallen Empires, only Org and Wall appear on just one card uh the following creature types are introduced in this expansion we don't play the game this time because it's not an in, it's not a single card there's a bunch of them so there's fungus homerid org soldier thrall townsfolk which was later changed to human unsurprisingly camerid oh it's like that's like the the thing that comes out of the homerid spawning bed yes <laughs> sure citizen saprling uh, which appears on tokens produced by cards in this set, the Thalids. Uh, and then we have the following creature types are used in Fallen Empires, but also appear in previous sets. Avatar, Cleric, Dwarf, Elf, Goblin, Merfolk, Orc, and Wall. What a mess. It's trying not to be a mess, and yet it is still somehow a mess. Yeah, that is... Uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize this set was this rough. So there's a way of of when you're immersed in it where you're you know you just get used to it you mm-hmm. absorb it mm-hmm. but this is for a set that's so small and like not you know not that many cards you remember and a uh, pretty tight construction among the creature type thing as you just mentioned it's exhausting it's just, yes it's really tiring <laughs> so when we were discussing at our pre-show you were like you know it's not like that bad or whatever and i'm like no that's horrible this is horrible i think that you're End show grade may change. No, it's not. No. Okay. No. Okay. When I, when I said horrible, when we were talking about this, talking about through the lens of power level, where the set is historically panned. Yes. So this set, in my opinion, we'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but it's actually reasonably powerful by the standards of the time. Certainly more powerful than the dark and more powerful than sets that came after it. But it's so boring. It's and extremely that's, boring. And the, and the most powerful cards are commons that are boring. Yes. That's where the perception, that combined with the fact that, well, you could get packs for a quarter. <laughs> sure, sure. So that's signaling something that's not great. And then you open up your pack and there's two Voldalian soldiers in it. And it's like with different art. It's Ooh. like, all right, I guess I understand why this is a quarter. Yep. Uh, but in terms of actual power level, it's. Uh, I think significantly underrated by the average player just because of reputation. There are some powerful cards and we haven't gotten to them yet. 
Uh, but what we have done is gone through our mechanics aspect of this episode, which means we're taking a short break. When we come back, it's time. Finally, a set has some cycles for us to go through. We're going to go over those in just a sec. All right, everybody, we are back to discuss the cycles here of Fallen Empires, and there are five of them. Finally, this set has cycles. Our last couple of sets did not have cycles, which cycles is kind of like my favorite part of the show. So I'm glad we could do these again. First cycle, Artifact Boons. Here, you might know some of these. Uh, each of these rare artifacts has a mana cost of two and an activated ability that cost one plus tap and sacrifice this. Uh, the effects of each of these artifacts is a weakened version of each of the boons from Alpha. Okay. Now, do you think you can name these cards just on their own? So, AEO Pile is a card that I actually played a lot of. Okay. And that's the two mana tap and one sack uh, to deal two damage. Which is a weakened version of? Lightning Bolt. That's correct. So, I'm trying to think of the other ones. There's five? There's five. Because I, re- I don't remember... I don't remember the name of the card, but I, I also remember the healing salve one, like the reverse AO pile. Yeah. I don't, but the other, I don't remember the other ones. All right. So the healing salve one is balm of restoration. Okay. Which is two and then one plus tap uh, to either gain two life or prevent two. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There's conch horn. Okay. Um, draw two cards, then put any one card from your hand back on top of your library. That's really fun. Way but a little worse than just, just let just let someone draw a card. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, just draw a card. <laughs> there was implements of sacrifice, uh, which was you sacrifice the thing. You pay the two plus the one in tap sacrifice. Sacrifice add to two mana of any one color to your mana pool. Place abilities and interrupt. So okay. weaker dark ritual. Sure. And then elven liar. Oh, L- that's right. L Y R E. Yeah, liar. The plus two plus two. Yeah, there you go. That's another card I actually played a little bit of. Okay, so there's your cycle. That's our first cycle. Let's go to our second Actually, cycle. Actually, pretty sweet cycle. It's not bad. That's cool. Yeah, it's not bad. Draw two, put one on top is just so... That's kind of stinky. Just draw one or dis- if you just need to make it juicier than cycling, uh, just put them on the bottom or discard one. Yeah. There's drawing cards and then putting cards back on top of your deck. It's not fun. so bad. It's not fun at all. Uh, token makers. Each of these non-creature spells, four enchantments and one sorcery, allows to create one one creature tokens of the same color uh, in the black aspect of this, it's 01 black creature tokens. Okay. Okay. So for white, it was Acacia town. town. Yep. Which you knew for blue, uh, the spore, uh, fungal bloom, blue, Homerid spawning bed. That's correct. Black, uh, breeding pool, breeding pit. There you go. Uh, red, uh, oh, some goblin, like you sack a goblin, make two one ones or something. I don't remember the name. I'm surprised. Wow. Goblin Warrens. Goblin Warrens. I am. Right. Su- yes. Okay. You did play this set. Yeah. And then for white. Occasion Town. Sorry. Sorry. For green. For green. My bad. Was, was that Fungal Bloom? No. Elvis Farmer? No. Uh, uh, mm, Blocking his view. Night Soil? That is correct. Okay. Nicely done. Nicely done. Okay. Okay. I didn't know. Oh. I didn't know it was gonna be game time. Okay. I'm having all these flashbacks. All these fallen <laughs> these, empire. These flashbacks. horrible cards. Yeah. It's like I'm thinking about night soil. Thinking about the first time my girlfriend dumped me. You know, <laughs> like, the, like you know, the first time I got a speeding ticket. Like all these childhood memories it, are coming. Yeah, like, coming in. All the bad ones are coming rushing back. Tribal creatures. Each of these permanents, four creatures in an enchantment, has an ability that affects creatures of a specific type by giving them bonus. Even the blue, uh, I'm not going to say the name, can be seen as allowing Merfolk with Island Home to take part in an attack. <laughs> okay. Do you think you can name any of these tribal creatures? Uh, I could give you an example. What of are them. the parameters again? Okay. Uh, each of these permanents has an ability that affects creatures of a specific type by giving them a bonus. Okay. So the white one is a uh, Cation Lieutenant. I do not remember this one. All right, so let's fire this baby up. I'm sure it's between us right now. Uh, all right, so white, white, one, two, summon soldier. One and a white target soldier gets plus one, plus zero oh until end of turn. Okay. And I'm going to assume you don't know the other ones. So I have no, yeah, no shot. Yeah, blue is Voldalian War Machine. 
Okay. One UU 04 wall. Uh, you can pay zero tap target Merfolk you control to allow Vodalian War Machine to attack this turn or to give Vodalian War Machine plus two plus one until end of turn. If Vodalian War Machine is put into the graveyard, all Merfolk tapped in this manner, oh this turn are destroyed. Yeah. So it's a, so it's an so it's an O four. Uh huh. If you tap one Merfolk, now it can attack. Uh huh. But it's an O four. That's correct. Everyone that you add to that is plus two plus one. So you tap the second Merfolk. Now you have a two five attacker. And if the thing dies, everything dies. Everything on the boat dies. I don't think that counts as an enabler. I mean, I know it's technically true, but that is rough. Black is Thrall Champion. Okay. So let's see what this humdinger does. Uh, Four and a black. So it's a five mana, two, two. All Thralls get plus one, plus one. You can tap it to take control of a target Thrall. You lose control of target Thrall if Thrall Champion leaves play, or you lose control of Thrall Champion. Okay. Okay. Uh, Red is Dwarven Lieutenant. This is RR for a 1-2. You can pay 1 and a red. Target Dwarf gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. And then green is Fungal Bloom. Yeah. And let's see what this thing does. This one is a green green enchantment. You can pay green green to put a spore counter on target fungus. Yeah. Sure. Yep. And then that allows you to start cranking out the thalads as it or cr- cranking out the saprolings as it were. Yeah. Not the best of cycles. Uh, sack lands. Each of these uncommon lands has this enters the battlefield tapped, and then you can add a color of mana or tap and sacrifice this land to add two colors of that mana where M is the respective color of the land. Uh, each also features art by Mark Poole, who's still doing it up today. Do you remember these lands? Uh, I mean, you know the red one. Yeah. Gordon Ruins, okay. Evan Stronghold. Correct. Sylvia Knight Temple. Correct. Ooh. Havenwood Battleground. You got one left. Uh, Ruins of Trocare. That's five for five. I want confetti. Yeah, just some. Some. I play with these cards a lot. These cards are good. This was one of the first like good decks that I built, like FNM level good for the time. Yeah. Were uh, just a ton of these lands in Armageddon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That plays. That plays. Yeah, turn three. Uh. uh <laughs> and play my lands. They go. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. It was nice. Uh, And then we have storage lands. Each Mm -hmm. of these uncommon lands has this enters the battlefield tapped. You may choose not to untap this during your untap step. At the beginning of your upkeep, if this is tapped, put a storage counter on it. Tap, remove any number of storage counters from this. Add M for each storage counter removed this way. Uh, Each was illustrated by Pat Morrissey. Do you remember any of these? Um, You just already mentioned them on the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Okay. So, uh, Ication Store. One. Uh, bottomless vault. Two, dwarven. Uh, not dwarven ruins, but dwarven. I don't want to do this. Dwarf, dwarven hold. <laughs> you can see midway through a card, you're gonna get right. You're yeah, I don't remember five. the other two. I don't remember. All the right, other hollow two. trees and sand silos. Sand silos. All right, right. there you go. Uh, Actually, these cards were kind of underrated. Yeah, because the game was played at such a slow pace. That you had like some room to take time off. Okay. And if you're just like turn one, play one of these tapped, like at some point you get to just do, do the thing. Like doing something with a bunch of mana was way more powerful than trying to play mana efficient turn after turn. Sure. So okay. it wasn't yeah. like these were competitive players really, but this is another set of cards in Fallen Empires that people kind of point at and laugh. And it's like, these were actually not horrible. At the I time. don't think these cards are terrible. They're not. I really don't. They had a purpose and the pace of play at the time was more accommodating to things like that. Okay. Uh, Fallen Empires also has seven mirrored pairs, including five enemy color posers. Uh, Acacia Lieutenant and Dwarven Lieutenant is a pair. Both creatures have the ability of uh, one plus the color of mana. They are white and red, respectively. Target soldier or dwarf. Uh, for occasion lieutenant, it's soldier. For dwarf and lieutenant, it's dwarf. Uh, the creature gets plus one, plus one, tone a turn. They both cost um, like white, white, or red, red, and are one twos. Okay, great. Fairlight priest and initiates of the ebon hand. These clerics can change the color of mana into their respective mana, but if the ability is activated more than three times in one turn, the cleric will be destroyed without regenerating. Also, both clerics have... Uh, one power, but different toughness, mana value, and rarity. Yeah, and Shades of Dragon Whelp there, of the uh, that sort of creative conceit of um, either with a baby dragon or some sort of uh, clergy or cultist member trying to 
channel some dark magic. Yeah. You can do some of it, but if you do too much of it, you'll die. You die. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we got Feral Zealot versus, I believe this is pronounced Necrite. Necrite, maybe? Yeah, Necrite was out. Necrite? Yeah. Um, both creatures have a similar ability that triggers if they attack them were not blocked. The pair is asymmetric. The white creature deals three damage to target creature, while the black creature must be sacrificed to destroy target creature. Both cost one MM and are two twos. Are they a replace replacement if they deal damage or just attacked and not blocked? Let's see. I've got Feral's Zealot here. So one dub dub, summon townsfolk. If Feral Zealot attacks and is not blocked, you may choose to have it deal three damage to a target creature. If you do, so it deals no damage to the opponent this turn. Well, those are sick with ninjas. Yeah, I guess that's true. First commander deck coming. Wow. Okay. Broke it. All the attacks and not blocked creatures (laughs) plus ninjas. Get yours today. Uh, Wherever you get cards. Wow. Uh, I've got (laughs) ninjas and first strike. Ever heard of it? I'm I'm sort of just trailing off into imagining my first commander deck now. Uh, Spirit Shield and Zelion Sword. These rare (laughs) artifacts both cost three and have two slash three and tap it. Target creature gets plus O plus two or uh, plus two plus O for as long as this remains tapped. You Mm -hmm. may choose not to untap this during your untap step. Play with those a little bit. Okay. They're whatever. Yeah. As as far as this set goes, I mean, you know, yeah, probably do a lot worse. Probably some of the better cards, I guess, in theory, then Uh, no tokens also. (laughs) Sure. Uh, Torx chant versus uh, Theon's chant. Uh, These uncommon enchantments, one black and one green, both cost one MM. So one black, black and one green, green uh, and must be sacrificed at the beginning of your upkeep unless you pay one mana of its color and deals three damage to any player who puts a basic land of the other co- other's color onto the battlefield unless they put a minus one, minus one creature, uh, minus one, minus one counter, excuse me, on a creature they control. Mm-hmm. Okay. River Merfolk versus Goblin Flotilla. Oh, yeah. These uncommon 2-2 creatures, one blue and one red, has or can gain a land walk ability corresponding to the other's color. Sure. Yes. Uh, Order of Lieber versus Order of the Ebon Hand. These common cleric creatures, one white and one black, both cost uh, MM, so one's uh, Order of Lieber's White, white, and then order of Ebon Hand is uh, black, black, and have protection from the other's color. And then you can pay one uh, for order of Libras. You can pay a white and give it first strike on another turn, and then white, white to give it plus one, plus oh, and same thing for the black one. Yeah, these were really good. These cards were good. Really good. I think, I think I played these in like Chandelar. Yeah. I think they were in there. Um, but like, I remember these were like, okay, these are like real cards. Yeah, these are quite a bit better than White Knight and Black Knight because yeah. there wasn't. Very much that punished one toughness. So yeah. the having the extra stuff to do with the mana. Uh black in particular really desired uh order of the ebon hand because uh you had dark ritual and then later on, like in the necropotents like of the dead sort of thing. Um, just something that you could dump mana into was sure. really desirable. Okay. And the card was also just fine, played normal. Okay. So th- that that card in particular has uh a tournament history, but order of Libra showed up as well. Uh, Homerage Shaman versus Thalen's Curse. These uncommon spells, one blue and one green, both have a mana cost that includes MM and play with a tap untap status of creatures of their of the other's color. And then last, and there is Heroism versus Raiding Party. These uncommon enchantments, one white and one red, both cost two plus the color. So two and a white or two and a red allow you to sacrifice a creature to force an opponent playing with the other's color to temporarily give up one resource, mana or an untapped creature, or lose another damage or lands. Smooth. Yeah, something like that. Uh, those are our cycles slash pairs. I'm so glad this part of the set is back because like the, in the early parts of Magic, uh, it feels like they're just like, we need to do some cycles. And then like most of the cycles just kind of suck. Yeah. And I really enjoy that actually. Yeah. I mean, this is this set, uh, uh, some uh, small pieces of redemption for it. That architecture that you just described around the creature types, it like kind of resembles a modern day magic set yeah. or at least a style of magic set. Yep. And the sets that came before that, you know, you have really nothing going on with creature types to the extent that there was a set that had like significant architecture underneath of it. It was antiquities where everything was an artifact or reference artifacts. Okay. This is like, it's, it's a bad execution, but that element of it is a big step forward. Yes. And obviously that has stayed with the game. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this is the, the one design sensibility from fallen empires that uh still sort of you know the sets down the family tree are still influenced by it very much so all right 
cycles, pairs, all that jazz done. Short break coming back. Normally, this is where the episodes get long with trivia and misprints. I have one thing to talk about in our next section. We'll see you here for that. In just a sec. All right, everybody, we are here now for the misprints slash trivia section of Fallen Empires. But as I mentioned just a moment ago, we've only got one thing to talk about here, but it is a doozy. So here we go. One of the most famous misprints of all time was a run of Fallen Empires that was printed with the backs from, I believe believe it's pronounced Wyvern. 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 Another TCG being manufactured at the same factory. These cards apparently are very valuable with fluctuating prices. So magic cards on the back, excuse me, on the front, Wyvern backs, which is obviously not supposed to happen. So I did a little digging and I found an article here written in March 2020 by Evan Simon. Evan, I'd like to give you all the credit in the world for putting this together. I'm going to do a little bit of reading from this. At some point or another, all card series are going to have misprints. It just happens. You print so many cards that a mistake is bound to be made, which, as we know, is true. Yep. We've covered plenty of misprints uh, over the course of this show already. While Magic the Gathering has had an odd few here and there, such as the infamous Summer Magic Blue Hurricane cards, but the biggest and most famous of these are what are now known as the Wyvern Backs. Back in the 1990s, the trading card game, this of course being Magic, was a much different landscape. The popularity of many games, such as Magic and later Pokemon, brought in a mountain of competitors in similar games hoping to follow the leader. One of these games just happened to be called a game called Wyvern. Now, before I continue, you ever play Wyvern? I own some Wyvern cards. Okay. Someone tried to teach me the rules and I either could not or did not want to get through it. Okay. So, no, I have never played a game of Wyvern, but... I was aware of it at the time, and I had a few cards randomly. Okay, never played it. Have no idea. Didn't yeah. know it existed until I did this research. Okay. With so many more games being printed after Magic's explosion in popularity in 1994, including Wyvern, printing was boosted all over, as we have learned with this set. Uh, as publish- At publisher Cardamundi, who was printing Magic, they were printing like crazy. That was especially true with Wyvern's 1995 debut coming near and Magic's Fallen Empire expansion coming even sooner that November. At some point, Wyvern's card backs got shuffled with a magic order and several managed to slip up and be warped into packs and get shipped off before they realize their mistake. Now, only common level cards managed to go out the door, apparently, but nonetheless, the damage was done. In 1995, players discovering Wyvern through their limited edition starter decks began finding rare random cards that were a bit more magical. The big W on the back was there, but the front was a random Fallen Empires card. At first, it wasn't all that different, albeit with many Magic players wanting to have really weird cards they couldn't play in duels because sleeves weren't exactly common back in the day. As soon as Wyvern ended for good in 1997, however, interest in the misprints shot through the roof, as they are one to do. The rarity of these cards was suddenly realized and prices have gone up and up since then. They currently go between $100 and $200 a card, with some going for even more than that. I've never seen any of the reprints. I've never seen one of these before. Yeah, to my ever, knowledge, to my knowledge, I've never seen one of these. Uh, and I'm since- just imagining the person who's like so excited that like, all right, you know, Fallen Empires, you know, I don't know what it was, but I just didn't have that much fun playing with it. Okay, I'm gonna try out this new card game called Wyvern, and you go your starter deck is just Fallen Empires cards. And yeah, <laughs> you know what? It's really t- funny. <laughs> it's time for a change. <laughs> I want to try a new game. And it's only commons. Yeah, it's just you open it up, and it's just a six evil daily insult. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With the four different arts. We're back. <laughs> uh, the final piece of this article here says, and since the Wyvern packs themselves don't go for much, it's not uncommon for magic collectors to buy them up and keep hold, keep hoping to find another one of these rarities. They aren't in many, but they still appear regularly on Amazon and eBay often enough that pack prices stay relatively low. While it wasn't the rarest misprint, it was by far the most widespread, and arguably infamous of all of magic's misprints. Uh, I am taking a look here. Uh, I'm seeing if I can find some sort of eBay lot or something like that. I can't find anything right off the jump, but magic players, they love a misprint. Sure. And you know, these aren't the best misprints in the world. These are far from the summer hurricane a summer magic, like blue hurricane misprint, but it's a misprint nonetheless. And it's frankly quite humorous. Yeah. There's something sort of charming about a misprint involving 
like one of Magic's most notorious sets meets a trading card game that lasted like two years. Yeah. 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 I love the idea, too, because, you know, this happened because this is just how the world works of like magic is going off and people are like, yo, we got to get in and make a game because like trading card games are going crazy. Now, naturally, I'm, I don't know all of them that were made then. Wyvern was, of course, one of them. As you mentioned, only lasted a handful of years. I'm sure many others just launched and then just did not go anywhere, whatever. But I just love the idea of like, what's this magic game? Oh, man, the TCG right. market. We could just go nuts. I remember the games that I played also around this time. OK. OK. So the Decipher Star Trek game. I want you to know, like when you say any of these games, know that I don't know any of them. The Decipher Star Wars game. Okay. Uh, Rage, which was a card game where you were like a werewolf or like an army of werewolves. Okay. All I remember about this game is that Eugene, you know, God bless him, but sometimes this got frustrating. (laughs) There, the Rage was I, the first card game that I could really remember with like ultra ultra rares that were cracked. Okay. And Eugene busted like four of them in two boxes. Of course. So the games were just so horrible. It's, it's deck. He's just crushing you. It was just vintage versus sealed deck. <laughs> and also Eugene knew the rules okay. and we didn't. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anyone, any, those are the three that I recall playing besides Magic. Okay. None of them really stuck. Yeah. This was so 94. I'm born in 86, so I'm like, I am eight. This is me. I'm video gaming. I'm not playing cards at this point or anything. I'm still playing like whatever came out then. Probably not PlayStation yet, but probably like Super Nintendo or whatever. So, yeah, I am not in TCGs at all mm-hmm. at this point. So your Wyverns, your Rages, your anythings. I, nope. Star Trek was kind of fun. It was charming in its own way. Okay. I believe you. It's the only game that I ever had to quit because of the templating. Okay. Because the cards were so poorly written that I could not understand how they worked. Okay, sure. So one of the cards was just an artifact that was like, uh, it was like at the end of your turn, take another turn. And it's like, does this ever stop? That doesn't seem very fair. Well, I think how it's supposed to work is you, you, them, you, you, them. Okay. But the way it's worded is just you, 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 Cast this, you lose. There's a bunch of smaller examples of it, but templating matters. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, that's it for our misprint slash trivia aspect of our Fallen Empires episode, which means it's time to get to the best part of the show. Award show coming up right after this. All right, everybody. It is now time for my favorite part of the show. Your favorite part of the show where you disagree with us in the YouTube comments. It's time for the award show here. For Fallen Empires, and we are going to kick things off as we always do with the Oko Thief of Crowns Award for best card in this set. And before you answer, this is normally the part of the show where people are watching and they're like, there's so many cards I didn't mention. Go ahead. It's in the Torak. Yeah, it's not even close. It was <laughs> so in the Torak is was busted at the time. I think would be if you just like printed it today, it would be banned in standard, banned in pioneer. <laughs> Reasonable chance that it would get banned in modern. <laughs> Probably banned in modern, yeah. And Legacy, a format that's pretty hostile to like two mana sorceries that don't impact the board uh, and that are not about forwarding your own plan, just disrupting your opponent, still shows up. Yeah. Busted. Yeah. Best card by a laughable amount. Uh, let's go to the Carnival of Souls Award for worst card in this ad. My selection is, I don't know, is it Delif? <laughs> I don't know. Who, fine I, don't know who, I don't know who Delif is or Delif. Or Detlef Shrimp. It's Detlef's Cube. Uh, this card is horrible. Uh, I want to read this one really quick if I can. Let's see if I got the Scryfall page open still. Oh my gosh. There's, there's something to do with attacking. Yeah, it's it's basically you're unblocked. It's like an unblocking enabler or payout for having things attacked and not blocked. All right, here we go. One mana, two and tap. If target creature you control attacks and is not blocked, it deals no damage to the opponent. And instead, you can put a cube counter on Delif's cube. And then two mana, you don't have to tap it. What a deal. Uh, remove a cube counter to regenerate a target creature. So, you know, you get in. Creatures this unblocked. is also sick in the ninja deck. Jeez, it's not. Because they, like, first of all, you ninja, so that's free. Okay. And then your ninjas have to be blocked on subsequent turns. And then the regeneration kicks in. Oh. Because either your ninja connects or they block and you just regenerate and kill the thing. Okay. Yeah. Ninja yeah. ninja commander stable. Nin- ninja cube. Yeah, ninja cube. Uh your 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 worst card. Acacia Town. Like it's just a lot of mana to pay for four tokens and it's 
not like that much fun uh or good and it's very it's very weak and boring and even at the time where there wasn't like the saturation of token generation it was weak and boring i like to call it bad battle screech well it's a combo with hand of justice which we'll get to in a oh moment. yes we the will. natural curve yes yeah. El natural. Yeah. Uh, all right, we're gonna go to the Doomblade Award for best non-rare in the set. Your selection was it? Uh, Dwarven ruins. Nope. Dwarven. Nope. Oh, help me out here. This Order of the Ebon Hand. Oh yeah, Order of the Ebon Hand. Yeah. yeah, just really good on rate creature. Just like surprisingly usable. Sure. <laughs> I guess <laughs> you can't say you can't say about most cards in this yeah, set. Just yeah. a really good, just really good efficient creature. If you print it today, it would be useful. I like surprisingly useful. Yeah, it did some stuff. Uh, my selection is High Tide, mm. uh, which is a card that saw play in like Solidarity and Legacy, but I'm sure it's all play in like other construction extended. Decks. Yeah, like in extended. like the 99, 98 era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been at uh, not frequently because it's a function of large card pools. Um, you you need to have a lot of specific cards surrounding it to make it good. But there were times where High Tide was one of the foundational cards of competitive constructed formats. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to the Aboro Palace and the Clouds Award for fun of one of them in the set. Uh, my selection is Havenwood Battleground. The reason I selected this card is because I believe I only played like one copy in the Alluren deck that I was doing well with in Magic Online circa like 2009 uh, and then got people to play at a Grand Prix in Columbus and like everyone who played it just did terribly with it because the deck was bad. Uh, and I also went like, I think, I, I, I know I went 03. I just don't know if I went 03, 06 or 03, 16 with the deck in that Grand Prix after my buys. So that's my choice. Yours? Uh, Hand of Justice. Okay. Just played one copy in some decks. Came up sometimes. Again, wasn't good at all. Sure. And it's not, you know, the experience of having two copies of Hand of Justice in play or two copies in your hand. Neither is particularly fun. So I'll give the fun of one of the Hand of Justice. Seems like it should be legendary. Yeah, it's so weird. There's no... All the fun stuff from the other sets isn't here. Yeah. It's all gone. It Why? Is, it is summon avatar. Yeah. It's so weird too, because the Ications have this like very, it's just a town. It's a village and there's like random soldiers and money changers and bureaucrats and stuff. Maybe this, maybe this dude just runs the town. Yeah. Why is that not mayor? Yeah. <laughs> mayor of justice. Yeah. Just mayor justice. Yeah. <laughs> Just us. Yeah. Mayor Justice for just us. Uh, the Mystic Confluence Award for Best Vintage Cube Card in the set. We have the same answer. <laughs> it's Tim Dutorak. Yeah, it's Tim Dutorak. But shout out to High Tide as being occasionally hilarious. That's the second best card. Yeah. For it's sure. Occasionally very fun and very funny. Yeah. But him is, you know, it's really good. Uh, speaking of High Tide, uh, the Smothering Tithe Award for Best Commander Card in the set. We again have the same answer and it is High Tide. So uh, congratulations to uh, the very powerful blue card. Uh, we go to the Pack Rat Award for Best Limited Card. Although, shout set. out Rainbow Veil. I don't know what that is. Oh, that's like a fun multiplayer card. That, what 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 color it's is a that? Collu- it's a land. It's Collusion Fest. But okay, you know. hang on. Add one man of any color to your mana pool. Control of Rainbow Veil passes to the opponent. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's like a multiplayer card. All right. Sure. Yeah. Sure. That's interesting. And it's like a fun multiplayer card. It's not just like, yeah, I'm scaling up this one thing because I have three opponents. Okay. It's like, look at this thing going on the table. Not strong enough to play, but a fun multiplayer card. Okay. Want to give it a little love here. Okay. Uh, Pack Rat Award for Best Limited Card in the set. Same answer again. It's Hand of Justice. Yeah. You can't kill anything in this set. Now, when you said you can't kill anything in this set, one thing I didn't do was check out like what kind of removals in this set. So you have Goblin Grenade. Yeah. And. Keep going. I'm going. Keep going. I'm going. I I think one of the, one of the attack did not block things. I think maybe you can sack to kill something. I don't really remember. Uh, neck right. Yeah. Okay. So neck right. Okay. Sort of counts. Not really. There's three versions of that. Yeah. Just three different got a lot artworks. Of yeah. One of them's actually really cool. I guess you could count hand of justice. <laughs> That's true. That's removal. three. That's three. Yeah, oh, this is unbelievable. Uh, you want to count him to Torak as a removal spell? No, not really. Bonk. Talking like some something interplay. What what happened? Yeah, there's him? like no removal in this set. This is outrageous. It's actually like back to back sets. That's pretty fascinating because the dark also has no removal. Yeah, yeah. This it's, is this is. Absolutely can you absurd. just give me a chain lightning, please? <laughs> Don't have, it doesn't have to be super busted or whatever. Just give me something that can interact with the creature. I guess I, it. I Javelin the ear. 
I mean, it can in theory kill not something. Really, but not again, really. Again, it's 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 like in the Necrite territory of like I guess, but not really. Yeah, yeah, you can't kill anything. Yeah, there's just like no removal of these sets, which is just, and then these games are just gonna bog down into just dude bozos. I, I'm telling you, Fallen Empires draft. I played a lot of it. Uh, like probably, I'm guessing among the top 100 human beings on Earth in terms of time spent playing Fallen Empires. Okay, it. It comes down to decking a lot. <laughs> you know what's another interesting to look for? Okay, go Creatures ahead. Creatures with flying. Uh, okay, hang with me. I'm I'll do, give you a minute on this. I'm gonna one. do my scryfall search. I'm gonna do Creatures a little Creatures with flying. The nice thing about about the uh, scry, uh, scrolling through scryfall is it's laid out very well, but also there's only a hundred some cards, so it doesn't take very long. Well, blue shouldn't have any flying because it's got hummers and crabs or whatever. Yeah, they're swimming. Yeah, so that's it's just, under the sea. Yeah. <laughs> It's Sebastian and, and Craig. That's right. So nothing going on there. Black. Uh, I'm trying to look for some goofball that would have flying. Like Evan Prater has trample and first strike. That's a good combination. Yeah. But that is not flying. Um, and there's no like vampire or anything. So, okay. Uh, red. There's no dragon. Is a goblin kite. Does that do something with flying? Ooh, let's take a look. Goblin kites. Plural. Interesting. Let's see what this does. Target creature you control with toughness two or less gains flying until in a turn. Flip a coin at the beginning of your next end step. If you lose the flip, sacrifice. Oh my god! I, okay, we don't have to go through. <laughs> oh my goodness! We don't have to go through all this. I will argue the set could have used more flying. <laughs> well, I don't even have to go through green because you know nothing in green is flying. It's just all fun guys. Yeah, yeah. No. yeah. These ground behind <laughs> these ground bound. Excuse me. Yeah. Saprolings and funguses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I think there's one thing that has flying in this set. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's go to the Char Rumbler Award for weirdest card in the set. Uh, I have Voldalian War Machine because you put on the Merfolk on the boat and then it gets killed or does it because there's no removal in the set. Right. So it's safe to put all the fishies on the boat. Uh, Evan Prater, just Franken running back Frankenstein's monster the next set, except making it actually more complicated and less fun is really rough. Uh, shout out the arts pretty charming so i'm gonna i'm gonna read horrifying i'm gonna read the praetor for people who don't know this card 4bb55 uh all right i'll do a good start yeah at first strike trample keep talking okay at the beginning of your upgate put a minus two minus two counter on evan praetor so it's just immediately down to a six mana three three or is it sacrifice a creature remove the minus two minus two counter from evan praetor if the sacrifice creature was a thrall put a plus one plus O counter on evan praetor Activate only during your upkeep and only once each turn. So you know what is a problem with this card among many? It, we're back in Frankenstein's monster land of you can have two different counters on this thing at the same time. <laughs> that's, that's right, you can. Yeah. Except also, not only is that typical from a tracking perspective, but also because one of the counters can be removed and then turned into the other one on condition. That's correct. Really, just... Just... <laughs> Can I get a Sanger Vampire? I, like, can you just give me a card that I know how it works and it plays okay and it's not, like, it's not a maze to figure out how to make my thing a 6-6. Six, six. Would, this, would this card crash magic online? For sure. Oh, that's, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Upkeep, minus two, minus two counter. Still in the upkeep. Remove the, my, sacrifice a thrall. Yeah. I guess. Just stuff is stacking. Yeah. Just, just popping just, just up. Just do it. Just do, 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 yeah. do. Yeah. The other person just like, you're going to time out. Yeah. That's what's going to happen to you. Just get a crawl word. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Uh, we have the blank award for best card name in the set. My selection is Goblin Grenade, which is a card we haven't talked about yet. This was, so when I started playing Magic a little bit, uh, I was like, I couldn't believe that something dealt five damage for one red mana. Mm -hmm. It was unfathomable to me. And the yeah. cost was very reasonable. Yeah. Just sacrifice a goblin, single red mana, kaboom. Not a bad card. And I remember playing at the local store and someone had like a four goblin grenade deck, obviously. And it's just like, what happened? They drew two goblin grenades. So That's the story every time. I, I, uh, you know, I tell a lot of stories about losing to Eugene. Yeah. The, the one time that Eugene beat me when I, the first time, really only time where I was like, he's got to be cheating. Like, there's no <laughs> way the rules work this way. Okay. Is he goblin grenaded me? And I'm like, in response, like, plow your goblin. Yeah, no. And he's like, no. No, it's gone. It's, it's, it's part of the cost. Yeah. 
I'm like, you're lying. <laughs> he can't keep getting away with this. There's no, there's no way. But yeah, it does actually work that way. It's sacrifice. It's destroyed as part of the cost. Okay, I have a weird question. This just came to mind. Like, they couldn't. Can they reprint this card? Goblin grenade? Yeah. Like, five damage for a single? Like, cause? I understand you need to need sacrifice a goblin, but like, that's not a high cost. It's, I mean, it's, 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 it would be a reprint with some level of risk. It really, of course, depends on how good the goblins are. But I'm Googling Goblin Grenade right now. Just this to see. is another one of like the, the set is just not as weak as people often discuss it as. OK, this is another card that's like, yeah, this is this could be really good. People play this in competitive decks now. So this card was in Masters Edition. It was in M uh, Magic 2012. Dual <laughs> dual decks, Goblins versus Merful. Sure. Uh, and then it was also in Jumpstart 2022. I so, mean, I've I've played against, you know, back when I was playing a lot more modern a few years ago, I would run into a goblin beat down deck, like some sort of bushwhacker sort of style deck. Yeah. Um, You know, probably one league in 10 or something like that. OK. And it the, I, I don't know. I'm sure the deck was not particularly good in, in a broad sense, but like it was really good against burn. And part of it was Goblin Grenade. Yeah, sure. Just so bursty. I mean, five's a ton. Five's a ton. Okay. They take no damage off their lands. You're taking damage off your lands. And it takes really little for you to get in range. Uh, Do you remember your answer for uh, the best card name in the set? Dwarven Ruins. That's correct. Love that card. Uh, And it's going to win another award for you in just a moment because we're moving on to the John Avon Award for best land land artwork in the set. Excuse me. And you selected Dwarven Ruins again. Yes. I want to talk a little bit about this card because okay. I love it and I want to unpack a little bit more about, you know, I played with it a lot as a kid and just kind of liked it. But now, um, you know, as an adult looking back, it's like I really do love this design. I'm going to pause you really quick. OK, uh, my answer for this was bottomless vault. I don't have a story, so you can put okay. that up and then boom, we're done. OK. OK, so the name Dwarven Ruins and the art, what is being conveyed here? Well, it looks like a mountain. Yep. And it looks abandoned and inert. So tapping for red mana, that's obvious. It's a it's a dwarven land. It looks like a mountain. Okay, we're good. Okay. The fact that it's abandoned and looking like inert, basically, comes into play tapped. But the fact that there's symbolism on top of the door there, and the fact that it's called dwarven ruins, like once upon a time dwarves were there, suggests that something very powerful could be underneath the surface. Sack for two mana. All of that, there's like such a rich story being told in an extremely simple card with just like a red, ra- seemingly random name and a random piece of art. Is this your favorite card of all time? It's up there. Yeah. I love this card. Uh, just a lot of nostalgia playing it as a kid and just appreciating the sometimes like the designs that are really brilliant and really resonant make the world feel bigger. Yeah. Uh, are simple. Doesn't have to be. Double-sided tackle maggots. Okay. It doesn't. It can, okay. it can look like this sometimes, too. Masterpiece. Uh, a Realist Freely Award, Time Graph Award. Don't have them yet, but we're getting there soon. Uh, which means we've got one thing left to do. All right. Let's grade Fallen Empires. Um, but before we give it our grade, we, of course, have to say... Which card won the set? Patrick, you may go first. Valid. Okay. Really love this card. It's, again, inspired uh, so many different sort of mechanics and individual cards of the years. I appreciate that it's not just a random thing. It makes a lot of sense for a fungus to be doing the sort of growing and self-replicating thing. Okay. If this was, let's say it was a townsfolk or a citizen. That card would also be beloved because people like doing the token stuff and it would be ahead of the curve in terms of, you know, the science behind magic development or whatever you want to call it. But the fact that it's a fungus makes it really, really good. Um, It's like fun. People love it. It was bad. People loved it. Sure. In spite of it being bad because it's really fun. And that's the reason that magic does. I mean, that whole experience of moving stuff around. My stuff's growing. I have some. Uh, I'm playing with a bunch of one ones, but I have some feeling of sustainability. Um, that is a great experience. One of one of the most fun experiences of magic and uh, Thalid is really kind of the the foundation of that. So oddly enough, uh, when we were going over a free show, uh, I had two answers. I had Thalid and then I had the answer I'm going to go with 
which is Hammerid. The reason I'm going with Hammerid is because it's just the first card I always think of when I think of this set. That is that is true. That is legit the first. Whenever anyone says Fallen Empires, I just think of horrible Hammerid. Just three mana, two, two. I'm going to read the card really quick. Three mana, two, two. Put a tide counter on Hammerid when it is brought into play and during your upkeep. If there is one tide counter on Hammerid, it gets minus one, minus one. If there, are, if there are three tide counters on Hammerid, I die. It gets plus one, plus one. When there are four tide counters on Hammerid, remove them all. Medium tide. Medium. <laughs> it's just the worst card. There's a story there. It's but there really is not, a story. There the is ju- a story. The juice is not worth the squeeze. Not even a little. Some this was someone's pet project. Yes. Yeah, that's great. There is someone in the world that enjoys this card a lot. Yeah. And I just kind of enjoy that, even though it's horrible and there's four different artworks of it. And it's like one of the things I love about Hamrit too is that, you know, they just I don't know what their game plan was. Maybe we'll learn that as we move to do more sets, but it's like, yo, these are gonna be the kind of like the blue people of magic, and they immediately were just like, No, it's not. These yeah. are terrible. We're going to Merfolk. We're never doing this again. Yeah, well, it's a weird space of like, okay, so you have Merfolk. Merfolk are kind of in this nice space of being an aquatic fantasy creature that can also basically behave like a human, like talk and hold weapons and all that kind of stuff is really good for art. Yeah. And, and sort of the creative space. And the, the ocean obviously has like sharks and other scary, scary creatures. You can yep. populate the world with plenty of that. Why do we need like a semi intelligent crab person? I, I have no idea. Like, can they talk? We it's don't not, know. Yeah, it's just not really. There was the beginning of an idea and then it was released. There was, <laughs> yeah, sure, no, sure. There was no progression of what the idea was supposed to be here. And I also, one they of the art's so funny on these things too. Well, one of the things that I find really humorous <laughs> about like the Homerids is that like they don't like, so there's Homerid. Which has the high tide, low tide, medium tide thing. Yeah. And then other things that have hammered on them have nothing to do with that. Yeah. So it's just like the one basic, like if I'm thinking like a Power Rangers, like the putties. And then like the other things just have nothing to do with it. It's just very strange. What I think is really strange about them is the Homerids themselves are sort of conveying like a, yeah, these things can like fight. Like their their body is naturally a lot of armor and they have pinchers. Like okay. these things can fight. Why do they have weapons? The <laughs> Homerids that are holding like axes and spears are so funny because it's like, well, it's hard to hold in a in a when you don't have thumbs, it's hard to hold objects like this. Like Homerid Warrior. Yeah, Homerid <laughs> Warrior. Like, look at that. I'm telling you, this thing would have fight way more effectively if it just put that thing down <laughs> and used its pinchers. <laughs> really funny. I mean, I can understand that this is. Like once you kind of botch it this bad, you're not supposed to go back. But I think that magic is richer for a handful of these being part of the game's history. Not only does this warrior have some sort of stick type axe thing, it also appears as though he, it may have a mustache. Oh yeah, they do. Yeah, they have like they kind of have facial hair <laughs> yeah. or whiskers. Yeah, I don't this, know. But no, but that particular one just looks like he's got a stash. Just didn't yeah. shave before the war. Yeah. You've just been out at war for too long. <laughs> just grow it. Yeah. Uh, all right. We're going to grade the set now. Um, <laughs> do you want to go first or should I? I'll go first. Go ahead. I'm giving Fallen Empires a three. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about what I like about the set, which is, um, first of all, the architecture around the creature types. Really solid. Okay. Giving two... Um, Creature types to each and sort of making one subsidiary to the other is pretty cool. Okay. And not that like you, you some of modern magic sensibilities are kind of piggybacking off of that sensibility. And it occurred here for the first time. That's great. OK, um, if you're a competitive player, there is a, an underrated amount of power in this set. Okay. Hinatorak, High Tide, Goblin Grenade. Uh, the five ETB tap lands, a couple other stuff kind of hanging out on the fringes, orderly burner, the other hand is like for a set that's small and panned for being weak, there are a surprising number of like multi format constructed stars in the set. Sure. Um, all right. So that's the good. Oh, sorry. Last thing that I appreciate about the set, they went overboard, but the sensibility of what if we really push token generation? It's actually like, no, they were. This is closer to correct than doing none of it at all. 
Okay. This is too much for sure. Okay. And the fact that there's so many different types of tokens is very bad. But this is this is a, actually a step in the right direction. It's several steps too far. Yes. But compared to sets prior to that, this has the a, a better sensibility about it than the other sets do. Okay. Okay. What to not like about the set? Okay. Uh, it's really boring. I- extremely boring. Like again, there are a lot of powerful cards in the set, but they're really boring. Okay. Him. Goblin Grenade, High Tide, the five enters the battlefield tap lands. That's a really boring collection for the top eight. You had to go to basically Order of Leaper and Order of the Ebon Hand before you get to things with a little bit of personality. Yep. And we're not talking about that much, especially because White Knight and Black Knight were already cards at this point. Okay. Um, the the fact that there's like no gold cards, no legends. What's what's going on there? Like, especially if you're gonna do a world that's all about like conflict and stuff. That's really rich opportunity to make some like weird color pairing stuff that would be really fun. Also, the fact that black is so loud with token sacking generation in the uh, in the thrall sort of stuff and phallids and to a lesser extent, the white cards are producing a lot of tokens would actually make for a fun multicolored pairing of sacking stuff is in black and the phallids are actually good to be sacrificing for X, Y, and Z reasons because you generate so many of them. Sure. You could actually start to see the architecture for some two color pairings that are just not touched at all. Okay. So the deck, the, the the set is really heavily emphasizes mono color in a way that's not really that fun, especially because <sighs> there's opportunities to do fun stuff across the colors in the set. Yep. Uh, the best cards are really boring. The best cards are boring and not fun to play against. It's not, it, and I mean, I've I played games that were basically Fallen Empire sealed. The game's unplayable. Okay. Get can I have a creature with flying? You may not. You can't put out well, a set that does not have a creature with flying. Well, I mean, you could have it temporarily. Yeah, it might maybe die. it might if die. it's small. Yeah, and then you flip a coin. Yeah, it might die. It's like the cards are not that much fun to play with, and the cards become like multiplicatively less fun to play with the more other Fallen Empires cards are in the game. Sure. It's really rough. Yep. Because then we both have Fallon. And then now we're both definitely not attacking. Just churning out Sapperlings. So I appreciate some of the stuff that's going on here. And like I said, I think underrated in terms of raw power level if you're a competitive player. But it's boring, not fun. And I can point to a lot of design opportunities on the table here that were just left. All right. I gave it a two. It's my lowest score. Uh, this set's horrible. I understand that there are some powerful cards, but also like if the best card in the set is Hindutorak, which is just you discard two random cards, that's horrible. Yeah, that's the that's a horrible best card to have. Definitely right. So if you're looking for like the power level, like I understand the argument you're making power level wise, but like if I'm looking at those cards, like how fun are they? How cool are they? Whatever. So there's Hindutorak, which is just like okay, you lose depending on like how the randomization goes. Okay. There's high tide, which is like, okay, anything you're doing with high tide is not fair. Yeah. Okay. And then there's the sacrifice lands, which anything you're doing with that is not fair. Right. So there isn't some sort of, okay, like this, there's no like siege rhino esque card. There's no ball lightning. Exactly. Right. There's no fell war stone. Yeah. None of that stuff. It's just, yeah. Boom. I'm doing something busted if I'm doing it at all with the best cards from this set. And then so there's the best cards, which you mentioned, which we've mentioned are like those five lands, high tide, and him. Right. So seven cards. And then they're like, all the other cards that are horrible, and then what's in the medium? Nothing. The two order of order of Ebonhand and order of Leaper. Those are the two. Those are like, like the two medium cards. Normal though. and reasonably powerful cards. Okay, so if so, I agree with you. And so, for sake of this thing that I'm doing here, there's the seven really good cards. There's the two orders, and then there's literally everything else. Well, I would also in between the orders and your top seven. Okay, I would also plug in Goblin Grenade. Okay, which is also pretty extreme. Like it's yeah. it's more fair than the other seven for sure. Sure, but to the extent that anything's going on there is facilitating really bursty kills. Yeah. So basically, like the the argument I'm making here, for lack of a better term, is just like there's no like medium stuff to do. Right. Right. And then there's a l- I mean there is a lot of like this card sucks. This card's boring. You know, all this all, all that stuff that's thrown in here. And then also, I think this is a huge strike against the set. Just having all of these different versions of commons is just a horrible experience for definitely in franchise players. I don't know how I feel about new players who are just like, Hey, 
magic. My friends have been telling me about magic. I want to go buy some booster packs. And like you open up a booster pack. You don't know anything that's going on. It's just like you open a booster pack and you open like two, two of the Valdarian what singer, whatever it's called. Uh, Sentinel. Valdarian well, soldier, I, soldier. Soldier. Yeah. You open like two of those. And they're two <laughs> different artwork. And it's like, they're the same card. I have two of these. Like they don't really have a good idea if it's good or bad or not, but it's just like, this isn't a particularly fun experience. You just gave me an idea. Okay. You know, uh, what could be really fun to do with this set is like, if you want to do the multiple art thing, it's only on the thralls because the notion is that like, they're just disposable, like totally redundant, no personality garbage. Sure. That actually creates some definition. Sure. Once you're doing it on that and Ication Javelin ear, now it's all thrown out the window. Yeah. So I think that that experience just kind of sucks. And like I know like in the early part of the show and the facts, it was like, yeah, they learned that having <laughs> multiple artworks on commons is not really a good idea. But they also did this previously now in antiquity, as you mentioned. Now, maybe it was more of a hidden antiquities because like the four mistress factories were seasonal and the four like all of the Urzatron, there's 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 tower power plant and mine. There's four versions of it. Right. And mm -hmm. then there's strip mine, which is, as you said, it's like basically all the same. Right. But they decided we're going to try it on commons. And I'm OK with like trying it on some commons. But they were just like, we're going to try it on a bunch of commons. And so I think the experience of opening booster packs for this set just sucked. Oh, it did. It just had to suck. Like this is before the Internet. So. I imagine that. You're opening booster packs and there's all the, the, the feeling now, even like when you open a booster pack, it's just like, what could be in here? And back then, because you don't know exactly what's in the set, because you don't really have like a good way of knowing. It's just like, this could be anything. And it's just, you just open up trash repeatedly over and over and over and over again. And that is just not fun. It's even worse than that because like you buy, let's say you go to the store, you buy five packs, 10 packs when the set comes out, you're thumbing through the new, uh, Encountering a piece of art you haven't encountered before tells your brain this is a new card. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, it's it's not. It's another homerid. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Really rough. Yeah. Really rough. So that experience is just like, and it, I'm just gonna extrapolate on that. Like I can imagine opening into I've never seen this card before, and it's just like you read it and you're just like, Oh, this is just this stupid thing again. Yeah. But like a different version of it. Like what what the heck? Right. And like you have that experience so much in this set uh, because they did the run with commons and all these different artworks. It's just. It's really bad, man. Yep. It's really, really, really bad. Uh, I do agree with you on the whole that like there are some powerful cards that are in here, most notably him to Torak. But again, if that's like your best card, your set's a disaster. Definitely. I, I only mention that because. First of all, a lot of players, when they think about sets, old sets. What they think about is the tournament staples or the commander staples. Yep. And because Fallen Empires is so historically panned, it's very common to be like, oh, yeah, you hear you still hear today. Like, oh, yeah, Fallen Empires is so bad. And it's like, no, that's not the problem. There's actually quite a few very powerful cards in this set. They're just really boring yep. and they facilitate very bad play patterns. Yep. It's like go back to the dark. The dark, definitely a weaker set. Yeah. Totally what are agree. the cards that you would have reticence about putting into standard? And it's like Felwar Stone, Maze of Ith. After that, it's like probably everything's you wouldn't even have to really talk about it. Well, here's it. Here, here's to further this point. Yeah. When we were doing when we were going over the awards in the dark and it was like, what's the best vintage cube card? And we're just like, uh, right. Like there isn't one. And then this mm -hmm. one, it's just like Hinotorak gets played in vintage cube. Yes. Like it's still in the vintage cube today, like on Magical Line or whatever, and you're happy to cast it. It's one of the more, more generically powerful just opening picks. Yeah. It's like whatever. It's fine. So the I, I only mentioned the powerful card just because that reputation that the Fallen Empires has as a, being a weak set, it is not deserved. It's horrible in a bunch of other respects. Yeah. And that combined with the fact that it's known as like the set that almost kind of killed magic because it was so overproduced and unpopular, people... And it's reasonable to do this. We're just like, yeah, that set sucks. But there's sort of an extension of that of like, oh, the set's really weak. No, the set's way more powerful than the dark. It's way more powerful than the sets that came afterwards. That's not the problem. Powerful cards are really boring and facilitate bad things. And there's no like, where's the fun? There's yeah. where's the fun? You look at ball lightning and felt war stone. That's fun. Yep. That stuff's still fun. Yep. And there's nothing in the set that is fun. Yeah. This set basically zero fun. The, the <laughs> like the, if we're doing the rundown really quick, so the seven most powerful cards, him, uh, high tide, and then like those five lands. Okay, so not 
it's just not getting reprinted. Yeah. It's not happening, right? right. It's, like, it's not re- like they're too powerful and they're not replayable because it's not fun. They're not about playing. They're really powerful and they have they have nothing to do with playing a two player game. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's Goblin Grenade, which is like extremely bursty. Right. The, the, it got most most recently reprinted in Magic 2012. Yeah. Because it's again jumpstart and like Merfolk versus Goblin. So none of those, those products don't count. OK, great. So that card's not coming back anytime soon. There's the order of the yeah. those guys, which, OK, whatever. But they don't put they don't want protection on creatures anymore. Certainly not creatures that cheap. Yes. So yeah. that's a no go. And then there's the rest of the set. Yeah. Which you wouldn't reprint because all the cards suck. AO pile, you could reprint and would be somewhat useful. Okay, sure. Uh Rainbow Veil is kind of fun in its own way, but it's off kind of in its own space. It's like commander ish. Right. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. just very weird. Yeah, thing. yeah. I mean, yeah. There's not there's like really no fun cards. Yeah. Yeah. I think like Pulling the lens back a little bit, there's things from the set that you could borrow and learn from. There is the hint of some good design principles here, mm-hmm. things that are actually steps forward and um, you know move the craft forward. But the actual cards themselves are really rough, yeah. and that combined with the experience of opening packs being really rough, it's like it's there's a reason it has the reputation that it has. Yep, it's not a power level issue as such. But it it's multiplied by the fact that there's other things going on that make it the sum of everything so unfun. Uh, scoreboard time, where you can see what we gave. Every set that we've covered so far, ABU, a 10 from both of us, revised a 7 from me, a 9 from Patrick. The Dark, which was our episode previous to this, I gave a 3. You did not give it a 10. What did I... What'd you give that? I don't remember. I believe a six. I think you gave it a six. Yeah, I wrote down the wrong number in my notes here. Sorry. I'm sure it's right on the screen. And then Fallen Empires added to this. I gave it a two. You gave it a three, which is your lowest grade by quite a bit. So that leads us into where we're going next. Fourth edition. <laughs> okay. Uh, Another one that was like really formative for me early on. Yeah. Look. There's some interesting things that have happened in fourth edition. Uh, most notably, um, a new white mana symbol was introduced. New tap symbol was introduced. Um, they cut some cards out of the set. Uh, it looks like 51 cards were removed from revised and 122 cards from Arabian Nights and some changes to make fourth edition. Fourth edition was the first set to have some basic land printed on a separate print sheet and a bunch of other things that we'll talk about. So uh, this I know like coming into this, like, were we going to cover base sets or not or core sets? And I was like, yeah, there's some weird things going on there. Oh, fourth edition is you know, a great moment in Magic's kind of early evolution of just, we have this game. It's really, really popular. What can we do to move it forward? And someone said, I think the thing is more players have to be able to get their hands on strip mine. And so we have fourth edition. Perfect. <laughs> That's just perfect. I love that for them. I absolutely do. Uh, As far as closing down the episode is concerned, if you liked what you watched, uh, first and foremost, tell your friends. That's the easiest way. We love some word of mouth out here. Um, But you can also show your love by like, subscribe, uh, ring the bell, watch the episode, share them however you share them with folks. That's all very much appreciated. Uh, If you're not a patron, you can become one uh, at patreon.com slash the receivables where you get episodes of these particular things that we make a little bit early. You'll also get access to some cool swag, uh, all of which is now out the door for all of our patrons, which is fantastic. But if you become one, uh, depending on which tier you're at, you'll get signed lands from us or stickers or play mats. Uh, You can check that all over out on our Patreon page. And don't forget also on Patreon, we have our unsleeved podcast where we take questions from all of you jackal pups out there. uh, And we do about three episodes a month. That reach yeah. are about two hours long. So uh, you fire in your questions, whichever, whatever you want, excuse me. And we are happy to answer it. Um, and yeah, we're coming back with fourth edition. We've got some other fun things uh, that we've also got to work on. We got to do, uh, we got to find some packs of the dark to do an opening of those. We got to find some packs of, oh, <laughs> you want to, you want to crank it over. I guess we... You want to give this thing away? I guess we... I don't know. We can figure something out. Yeah, I don't mind yeah. giving this thing we away. Can, we can figure we'll something out. We'll figure something out. To crank out, out the Patreon. We'll do something with yeah, this. Yeah, to crank out some Pacs of Fallen Empires. You know, I think... I feel like 
someone who didn't have the experience of opening up these packs mm -hmm. should have the experience of opening up these packs. Okay. So we'll figure it out, but okay. I'll do something with this thing. Um, and we are still working on finalizing our playing of the 1994 uh, Magic World Championship as well. So we got some fun things coming for you fine folks over the course of this summer. Uh, but we are all done now with covering Fallen Empire. So for Patrick Sullivan, I am Cedric Phillips. I want to thank you guys for watching. And we'll see you back here for fourth edition very soon. Homerids, huh? Uh, okay, I start to show up with this. Uh, I'm locked. I'm in the lock by this microphone. Cool. I did it. All right, here we go. You ready? Wait, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta watch the YouTube thing again so I remember how to open the show. Shut up. That was me talking. Yeah, I know. But that was that's me. Unbelievable. Whatever. Nope. Try again. It's hard. It's a hard job.